Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Neil Boddy. I'm from Goldman Sachs. Um, thank you very much for, for joining me in this, in this session. So in this session, what we're going to be, be doing is uh, dis discussing our shift from fairly traditional relational CRUD in which the, um, the tables in the database hold only the most latest information that the, uh, the system has to instead using a NoSQL date database and uh, a log. Now when I say log, I don't mean um, an application log or a log for j style log. What I mean is an append only log in which data changes are captured as, um, as events and then stored in that log. Now you may be wondering why on earth would anyone want to do this? Well, in the, the area that, that I, um, I come from, uh, master data management area, we have hundreds and hundreds of flows. The, the flows are relatively complex. Um, all, of the, all the flows are, very, are quite different. Um, we have lots of schemas, lots of databases, hundreds of them, and, um, and we're processing millions and millions of records every day. The data in the records that we process are themselves quite structurally complex in the sense that what we're dealing with is financial um, investment vehicles like sort of bonds and products and things like that. And the, the, um, an example of a bond has got um, 300 unique attributes. Now, due, due to the, the many one-to-many -many relationships of a, of a bond, at runtime, you may have many, many sort of thousands of attributes. So, so the, uh, the data is quite complex. So with an estate like this, managing it, there are a lot of sort of complexities and challenges to, uh, to deal with that. Um, so what I'll be doing is talking about the, the approach that we have taken to solve one area of that, our experiences and observations. Now we found that the, uh, the log-based technique not only enabled us to access and utilize a much richer body of state than was the case when we were dealing with um, relational incremental CRUD, but it also enabled us to lay solid engineering foundations, which um, uh, enabled us to improve our ability to, to standardize, um, access the data and create new opportunities, but also build a more um, fault tolerant and uh, a recoverable system. Now for someone who's been at the, uh, the sharp end of problems when the data in the database is wrong in a relational system where there's many, many tables, if not hundreds of tables, Recovering the, uh, the, uh, the state in a system like that and unwinding the records and the tables that have to is a very complex problem. So anything that, that offers resilience to that and indeed faster, faster recovery is going to be very, very appealing. Now in many ways, building a new architecture using non-traditional techniques like CRUD is going to be harder. There's going to be a whole bunch of new stuff that you have to learn. Um, for example, there's going to be new tech that you need to learn. Then there's a whole, a whole lot of new sort of concepts that you probably need to understand. And then it takes a while to uh, refine the, the techniques of using something. Like when I use a driver for the first time, a new technology, I don't get it right first time. It takes a while sort of, to sort of perfect that. However, on the other hand, um, if you're not using relational CRUD, then you won't have the problem of having to shred your object model into the different relations and to make that work in a, in a, in a performant manner if you've got reasonably high sort of throughput. However, if you're going to take on new engineering techniques, like, like a log, for example, for managing a lot of state, um, that's going to bring new engineering challenges. And for us, it's all very well putting lots of data into a log, um, but then when you have to basically traverse that log and pull the data out to, to deal with the business use cases, that for us was our engineering challenge. However, we found that through the use of data aggregates, through the use of very explicit modeling and sort of embracing the ideas of event sourcing, and in conjunction with the no scalability with, with the no SQL scalability features, we are able to to um, solve old and familiar problems in much more standardised and uh, and scalable ways. So this talk will be presented in the form of of a case study, and I hope it will be of interest to anyone who is thinking of moving away from the traditional incremental CRUD and embracing the new ideas in um, in the sort of no 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 SQL world. Okay, so that was mainly the, the introduction. Well, the, um, the, the context of the work that I did was, was the master data management area, so I'm not going to dwell on that because the, uh, the concepts and the, and the topic that we're going to talk about is not really, uh, MDM is not really central to this, to this topic. Um, indeed, all these ideas are broadly ap applicable to most applications, indeed the, uh, the data-centric applications. However, I need to mention it in passing because I need, to allude for it to, I, I, I need to allude to this from sort of time to time when we talk about the sort of processing model. So I just wanted to spend a kind of a one minute 
on, on, the, on master data management. So it's really all about the, the processes and the tools and the policies for creating the critical data that's actually used throughout the firm. So everyone in the firm would then, the different departments would then use that. And the, the emphasis is really on creating a single version of the truth that again is used by everyone throughout the firm. So I've got a couple of different flavors and some examples here. So on one side we have the other uh, dynamic uh, data, which is really about sort of products and customers. We expect this to be changing quite rapidly. Inventory, inventory management, accounts, companies. And certainly the area that I'm talking about at the moment, where we're dealing with financial investments, um, securities like equities and fixed income products and bonds, contractuals, and options and futures, and that sort of data, and prices as well. And this is information that, 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 cha that is changing very, very rapidly. Um, then on the other side of it, the reference data, we have the, you know, the real sort of core static data, like countries, currencies, uh, optionality in the application, and, um, and sort of type enum type codes. Now, what we have here is the typical architectural arrangement that, that, that we would have in our, in our domain for dealing with these sorts of problems. As you probably recognize, it, it's a um, fairly standard sort of pipe and filters architecture in which we have different filters or stages which are interconnected by queues. Each stage is a sort of a single responsibility um, capability, um, all running in their, own, in their own thread. So overall, concurrently, you have a nice concurrent sort of architecture. On the left-hand side, we have data which is coming in in the form of records. That could be from files, from a database, from a REST call, any source, really. There may be some sort of pre-processing that has to be done, often staging, where we have to stitch together fragmented data. The, uh, the transformation where we take the incoming data and we want to transform it into the uh, canonical form that will then be used throughout the rest of the firm. Um, and, and also for downstream processing. And then there's resolution, we have to look data up because very often what we're, what we're doing is performing updates and derivation, then validation, and then finally, finally persistence. So we would expect this to run typically as a job. It can also be a sort of a stream, but uh, a job will have a begin and end and it may be running for a few minutes or for several hours, depending on the intensity of the data that we're, that we're um, processing. So until the last few years, um, CRUD, incremental CRUD, has been the, you know, the standard, standard technique for persisting uh, data um, in a relational system. And this has certainly been the case in the master data management space where I've, I have been working. And this is illustrated here with lots of different heterogeneous flows. So we might have, you know, the first one could be processing, F of X could be processing equity data, um, you know, bonds and um, financial instruments such as, such as IBM shares. Then the other one might be processing legal company information. Again, information has got to be shared and used throughout the firm. Then the next one could be processing listed derivatives, option futures, and those sorts of things. Um, now, the thing about these applications is that they, they, they've all been written to process data, they only exist for data, and some of them can be data intensive. Now, this arrangement um, does seem to work reasonably well. It isn't, it isn't too complicated, so why make it more complicated? Well, you know, the fact is, is that in our world, um, we have hundreds of these flows, hundreds of databases, hundreds of schemas, all engineered for the specific flows. And hence, the, the variation is expensive. You know, we're dealing with multi-structured data, custom schemas, and variation hurts. Indeed, even if you use standardized libraries in those different sort of functional stages, um, the, the variation always creeps in when you scale it up to the hundreds and the many, many hundreds, like 600 plus, that, that's, that, that, is, um, that, that doesn't really scale. Then you also need sort of the uh, domain-specific knowledge to deal with sort of complex changes or even sort of production events where there's something's gone wrong and we need to get up and running very, very quickly. Now, I'm sure you can imagine if you need to bring in specialists, experts on a particular flow, that also scales very badly. Now, for some of our more data-intensive flows, we've had to make considerable investment in the performance to get the throughput that we needed into the relational system. For the higher data set operations, sometimes we need to compare a whole universe, um, tens of millions of records with another universe, a full universe of data, like all the equities um, on the markets yesterday and today, for example. And in those cases, the, 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 the large set operations haven't scaled well. We have different solutions um, for that. And another um, challenge with this particular arrangement, particularly into a CRUD system, is that the, the data that, that sort of flows in must be processed in, in strict sequential order. Now, um, I mentioned in the introduction that um, you know, a system that is, that is sort of tolerant to data failures and indeed 
um, is, has, has the ability to be rapid, rapidly recovered is going to be very, very appealing. Now, if you break the state of a database because you ran through some rogue data, unwinding hundreds or you know, thousands of, of incorrect data is not only difficult, it's uh, fiddly, it's unintuitive, it's error-prone, it's uh, costly, and when you have a high severity error um, hanging over you, um, it's also very, very stressful. So when, when we get data wrong in our system, it's used throughout the firm and we find out pretty quickly. I mean, we had an incident um, a little while ago. Um, I'm not sure whether it was a bug in the code or whether it was an upstream problem, but on a given date like the 3rd of March, rather than processing the equity data for the 3rd of March for that year, for some reason it managed to pick up the data from the previous year and then it sort of corrupted effectively thousands of, of records and, and a SEV1 came pretty quickly. Um, now, in order to, to kind of unwind a situation like that during business hours, then there needs to be a lot of forensic analysis on the, on the tables and the data in there to try and understand, well, what is the damage um, and how bad is it? Then you have to devise a plan to, uh, you know, to work out how you're going to recover the state. You'd have to jump on multiple calls with um, stakeholders and everyone's interested and they want to know what the ETA is and it's a fairly complex thing to do. You'd have to create a migration at the data level, which again is going to be complex and unintuitive, and then execute a migration under non-business-as-usual conditions. Now, when you do that, you might be pumping through larger volumes of, of, um, of data, in which case you could be exercising parts of the system that haven't been exercised in a while, and you might find that you could run out of disk or you have memory problems. So when that happens, you know, it's got to be handheld. Anyway, it's, uh, it's fairly sort of costly and expensive. Now, the, the list of, of you know, causes of these sorts of you know, failures is really endless, but you know, to give just a few examples, obviously, errors that sort of materialize from, from buggy code um, that has just been released. Uh, if you do a data mi migration that has omitted to consider some nasty or esoteric uh, edge cases is a, is a common failure, or even an upstream problem that then results in cascading failures. Now, failures due to human intervention are particularly hard to guard against, um, and you know, again, the usual lessons learned are we should have done more testing, should have had better knowledge of the uh, domain, better SDLC um, procedures, better review procedures, better release automation, all these sorts of things. You know, the, 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 list of it, the list is endless of all the things that we, um, shouldn't, that, that we should have done better. So this next slide seeks to illustrate the sort of intrinsic sort of fragility of this kind of processing with, with a CRUD-based system. So in the, in the top right, we have the data you know, flowing in. We have sort of records or data D1 to D to N. And then we have the normal, typical sort of CRUD operation, which actually is going to be a lookup to find the existing state. Then there needs to be a merge, um, where the new image is then projected onto the um, existing ones. And that merge, if you've got a sort of a parent-child structure, that merge would obviously include uh, creating new child records, um, removing ones that are, that are retired and updating ones and leaving some alone, and then finally we have to save. Now to demonstrate the fragility of this, we have three batches at the top left, you know, batch one, batch two and batch three, that must be played in sequential order. Now after we've run batch one, we'd expect the state of the database here in the bottom to be A, B, you know, C and D. Okay, that's not rocket science. Now, after we've run batch two, now batch two isn't changing A, it's making an update to B, it's removing C, removing D, adding E, and establishing F as a record. So hence, we'd expect the records there at the bottom to appear like A, B dash to F. And then finally, the batch three, um, we have another update to B, we're reinserting D, but a, but a newer image of D, we're removing E, and record G is now being established as a child record of F. Now, obviously, the, the, the effect of applying this data in the wrong order, if we apply batch one first, then batch three, and then batch two, this is the kind of thing, you know, it really can happen. Um, we, then A is, is absolutely fine, because A's been untouched. We've got a stale value of B. Uh, D's missing, we expected it. We have a phantom record for E. F is a degenerate record, because F should actually have a child component, which is G, but it's quite possible that G was rejected because of referential integrity. Now, in general, um, you know, expected data is going to be missing. There's going to have phantom data, stale data, uh, missing relationships, unwanted relationships. Now, this is the sort of thing that happened when we reprocessed the equity data. And the unfortunate thing is, is that unlike a version control system, there isn't a reverse patch that we can just sort of go and apply. But it's actually OK, because funnily enough, it turns out that, it turns out that accountants have already solved this problem. 
What makes it worse is they've they have solved it hundreds of years ago in, in their bookkeeping practices. Now, if a mistake is made, the accountant doesn't go in and then remove and delete that record. They create a compensatory transaction to correct the position, thereby basically trapping you know, the full audit history of what's happened. Now, developing systems to be resilient to sort of human mistakes more broadly is, is a fairly complex and broad subject. I'm not going to discuss that in a lot of detail. However, Immutable append-only events um, that by their very nature of not changing state do not do irreversible damage to that state and are, an and are an important part of a solution seeking tolerance and recovery from faults. So let's take a look at the ideas now of log-based state management and event sourcing. So event sourcing is an alternative and powerful technique for managing states. The DDD community, the domain-driven design community, lay claim to having developed enterprise sourcing in which the state is constructed um, from the sequence of events that are sort of um, captured. So I have a, a classic um, shopping cart uh, example to illustrate the differences between the shopping cart and the, and the event sourcing log-based approach. So along the top, we have a user who's going to have added some books. He adds a book one, a book two, a book three. He adds another book two because he wants another one and then decides, oh no, I don't want book three after all. So we have the, the, the um, arrangement in the shopping cart and the event log. Now if we look at the shopping cart first, we can see that the shopping cart contains the correct state. It wants one book one and two book twos. Um, but that, that, that is exactly right and that is the purpose of his application to work out the order in order to, to process it. Now, some observations about this are that the event, the incoming business event, has been transformed into the read form. So when, the, when book three was removed, the reader, or the, sorry, the, the right thread, had to interpret that. Oh, what he really means is remove the record from the cart. Okay, that's fine. When book two was added for a second time, the writer had to transform that, that sort of concept into actually finding book two and then incrementing the count by one. Okay, it's not really rocket science. But of course, now that the writer has absorbed all that sort of complexity, but that's good because there's no netting for the, uh, the reader. The reader doesn't have to do the, uh, the math to work that out, and things are nicely optimized for the reader. But one interesting thing is, is that we, 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 that we haven't captured in, that, in, the, in the CRUD system, we haven't captured the intent. We've only captured the outcome of that activity. So information is, has been lost. And obviously, at the database level, there's going to be sort of locking so that the database can offer the uh, consistency guarantees that we expect. Now, in the um, event logging um, system, in the event sourcing log-based system, we can see that the um, events are captured there as, as fairly rich objects. We're adding book one, book two, book three. We add a second book two, and we finally remove book three. So um, within um, an event sort of sourcing system, um, the, the, the sort of focus here is more on capturing events at the level of abstraction that sort of represents the activities that, happening, that, that are happening within the domain. Um, a feature of this is that it means that you're, you know, if you model this more explicitly, it means that your, your software is going to be more closely aligned with the real activities that are happening in your application within your sort of domain. Um, and very often in software, if we make things, you know, explicit, that's normally a a positive thing within the software. So some other characteristics of this is that the, uh, the chain captures the full context of what happens. Um, th from a writer perspective, it, it's super easy. You know, the, the event comes along, the writer just has to create it, and he's decoupled from however the reader is going to process this. So the writer didn't have to find book two and increment the count, find book three and then remove it. He just dropped the, the event in. But of course, now the reader absorbs the, the netting effect. He's got to do all the maths to understand the state. But information is not lost in this system. The full intent of what the user was doing and what they were thinking is captured. And that can be exploited for different reasons. We could, we could run additional queries and a set of projections to, to analyze the data. We might see that book three is regularly sort of added and then removed. So perhaps there's a problem with the system. Perhaps book three is, is too expensive. The thing is about these if you, do a, if you do a projection, is that um, you, can, you can create them, you can edit them, you can throw them away, create new ones doesn't really matter, it doesn't change the underlying state of the, of the log that is, that is fully preserved. Another interesting thing is, is that we can generate secondary actions. So 
um, if we knew that the user was looking at book three, in a month's time, book three may have come down in price and we can let them know with an email that book three is now available at 10% of the cost. But that secondary action is entirely divorced from the original transaction. Now, this system is intrinsically more debuggable, it's more robust because we're not changing state, and, and it sort of lends itself to being a bit more performance and scalable, actually, um, because first of all, we're sort of we're creating an aggregate object, an aggregate event is being, is being stored. We're not shredding that, that data. Um, we don't have any sort of complexity at the database level in terms of managing locking and those sorts of aspects. And the fact that we are sort of storing a fully formed event as, as an aggregate object, that then lends itself to sort of um, horizontally, horizontally scaling um, across a partitioned network. So sort of with that in mind, rethinking the batch data set. Now, state that is shipped around the enterprise and around their firm and actually across businesses is very often chunked up into, into, into data sets as, 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 batches, as batches. And as we saw, the, the, the pipe and filters architecture would be then be used to, to run a job that will run to completion and process that. OK, at first glance, batch data might not seem very exciting. It might not offer much by way of inspiration. You know, we, we parse a file, we dump it into a database. So what? What's, what's really the big deal? Um, well, well, the thing about data is that the devil is in the detail, and data gets fiddly, it's quite hard to model and to find good abstractions for it, um, and it's, it's quite hard to standardise. And we're very much in the process of kind of rethinking the whole thing from, from the ground up, really to, to improve the whole data management strategy, and working to solve a lot of problems. So a batch, at first glance, you know, might just look like a collection of records. Indeed, they are important records. This is the reason those, those, those individual records in that file example are the reason that data is being published and sold in the first place, being consumed and distributed throughout the firm. But the thing that's interesting about the batch, if we, if we look closer and we drop the helicopter, is we see that there's different flavours of batches. You know, there's, there's like a full snapshot batch that might represent you know, the full universe of, of equities. And then we have another style of batch, which is the delta batch. Now, the delta batch actually sort of depends on the full, on the full snapshot batch because, because the delta has got to build on, on the data that, that is in the full. Now, the next one, the, uh, the C batch, that will be a correction batch, which is relative only to, to, to the delta that came immediately before it. And then another flavor of batch is the delta partial batch. Now, this particular guy will have all the changed records, um, but he won't contain the full image of those records, only contain a partial image in which case um, that information is useless in its own right until it's merged in with, with the state that has been accumulated from the full snapshot up to that, up to that point in time. Now, to, to, to kind of add a bit more richness to the, to the concept of, of batch data, um, what, what we find is, is that you, know, you wouldn't have a single batch that contained all the equities in the, um, in, 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 in the world that are being traded at that point in time. Um, what, what a vendor of data would do is then partition the data according to some notion of an enterprise segment. So we might have full Asia data, then we might have full European data, and a full universe for Americas. But we can see here that the Europe information builds on the information in Asia, and Americas builds on the, uh, the Europe information. So it doesn't really matter about what the batch is. What's clear is that when we process data as a batch, it's not just the records that are important, but actually the batch carries important information. If we throw away, um, it makes our processing harder. Now, we had written all of these flows that we have there, H of X as examples, and they could process the information in the batch. They understood the records very, very well. All of these flows are very complex. But they didn't really understand the semantics of the batch. And therefore, we had to rely on, on tribal knowledge to know, well, what, what, what can we run? When can we run it? Uh, what order do we have to run something in, particularly if we're recovering from a failure? And is it even you know, safe to run? Now, we were quite keen to embrace the ideas of event sourcing and then to kind of to capture the knowledge in the software of these batch concepts. And in doing so, we could start to solve existing problems in more intuitive and sustainable ways rather than relying on, the, on tribal knowledge. Now, in the top right, we have a sort of a real example how data will come in, and it's often fragmented across many files. So we have a financial instrument that is fragmented across four files. Then we have enterprise segments, which is North America, Latin, Europe, and Asia. And then we have full and difference files. Um, so altogether, we have about sort of 32 different pieces of data that we have to pull together in order to process it. And finally, we have a, a pretentious um, sort of formulation down here in the bottom, 
which sort of tries to capture the idea that, that, that what we have here is the superposition of, of states. And so to know what the state is at any particular point in time, we have to accumulate the state from a starting point and all the delta and, and, the, and the correction files. But the, the useful thing about this sort of functional um, sort of model that we have here is that it's, it's starting to align quite nicely with the ideas of, um, of event sourcing, where we create a, a log of changes. Now, the, the change events in the log naturally form a, um, a time series. So to understand, well, to properly understand the log, you need to understand the time in the log. And that's what's being illustrated here. So business data is typically um, issued according to some um, business date. In other words, that will be the date at which the data, the records in the file or the database are, are effective. So this is along the, the x-axis. You know, Sunday, we have Sunday's data, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. Why that information is useful, it doesn't tell us anything about, obviously, when that, when that data is processed. And this is obviously the system processing time on the y-axis. So we can see that the first thing on Sunday at about I'm looking on the, on the y-axis on the left-hand side. Perhaps at 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, we processed the data that had an effective date of Sunday. Then the first thing on Monday morning, uh, point B, is where we had to reprocess Sunday's data, or data that was effective on Sunday. You know, perhaps there was a problem with the processing, um, perhaps a correction file had been issued for Sunday's data. So that's been reprocessed. Now, sometime later, point C, on, on, on Monday, we process the, the, the data then. Similarly, on Tuesday, Wednesday, we process it, but the, thir the first thing we do on Thursday is we reprocess you know, Wednesday's data. Similarly, perhaps there was a system problem or correction data, and, th and Thursday and Friday. So if we wanted to understand in our log what, what did the data look like, or sorry, what, was, what data was effective for Thursday, for, for Wednesday, my apologies, it would be this space here. No, sorry, what data was, was effective as at, on, on Wednesday, but if we're looking on Friday, what we would then see is it's B, C, D, and F. However, if we wanted to know what data was effective on Wednesday, but as at Wednesday, then we have to wind the system time back, and we'd see that well, the, the last thing that we processed on Wednesday was E, so in which case it would be B, C, D, and E. Okay, now in, in, in our world of master data, um, we don't have to solve the, the problem of dealing with the, um, with, with the, uh, the shopping cart. Um, but of course, that was the immediate processing problem, and that was then the problem for our, our reader. Um, certainly in, in, uh, in my world, the, the, the pro one of the problems that we have to solve with our data is, that, as I mentioned before, that data is typically highly fragmented. And that's illustrated here with the use, with the illustration of, of, of the car. So the car might come, the, 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 the car is composed of a number of elements, um, engine, chassis, cabin, and the transmission system. And the, the car data is supplied in a car batch, the engine in an engine batch, cabin, and transmission system. Now, what we wanted to do, it was really a design decision, was work with with aggregates, because a data aggregate has some useful technical properties. Um, it is the, the unit of logical consistency to begin with. So if you wanted to know whether the engine data is consistent with your chassis data, then you would need to really have the elements of the car. And similarly, if what you've got is a, is a, um, a four-speed uh, transmission, sorry, uh, a four-wheel transmission system, it needs to be compatible with the, with the right sort of chassis for the car. So it offers us logical consistency quite easily. Then it also lends itself to being the, uh, the unit of work, the unit of work for processing, because it's a whole piece of data. It's useful for validation. It's useful for de derivation and for processing in, in the downstream flows. It also offers a unit of, of atomic storage consistency, um, which lends itself to being, to being sharded and uh, saved in a, in a distributed system. And it also um, uh, in, 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 in an atomic way. But it also offers an intuitive data structure that is, that is quite easy to, uh, to reason about. So if you imagine our pipe and filters you know, framework processing this data, what we might have at time T1 is the main elements of the car come in for the very, very first time. Uh, at T2, we might have an update to the engine and the, um, and the, and the, uh, the cabin. And then finally, at T3, we've got one last update to our engine. So in the bottom, we have the compositions of the aggregates, which is going to be T1, um, which is the initial representation. T2, we see our update to our engine and our uh, cabin. And then finally, we have the update to the engine in T3. 
Right, now we used Mongo as our, as our system for, sort of for, for capturing our data and using it as our, as our log. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, now Mongo is a, a document store, and data is stored in a collections, and data is stored in the form of a document then in those collections. I've got a couple of examples here. So we have a collection. Th this, the collection there on the top left is representing our log. And in there, we have some information about the, um, the, uh, the cabin. And it has body, it has a, number, it has a body section, a number of seats, airbags, etc. cetera. Um, and then in, in the top, we have the final update to our engine, which again has different sets of data. So for us, using Mongo was, was, was quite a big win in the sense that, that we have a lot of multi-structured data in our space. And Mongo then made it easy, easier for us to, uh, to do that, so we didn't have the proliferation of, of custom schemas. Um, we also so embrace the, the ideas of, of event sourcing and then fully, fully modelled um, very explicitly the ideas of the, of the different flavours of batches, like the full and the deltas and the sort of corrections and the enterprise segments, and really capture that information. Now, we, we could have modelled that and stored that into um, a set of relational tables, uh, absolutely, but I think it's notable that, that we found that you know, creating an aggregate for that data and then storing it into a document like this offered a very f low, f low friction form of persistence for us. Um, in, within Mongo, you can, you can, th they offer multiple, multiple shards where the data is sort of partitioned across lots and lots of shards, and you can add additional shards to it to increase the, uh, the scalability, um, which is, again was very useful when you have a very, very large log and you do lots of processing. Uh, interestingly, then it offers the ability to, to spread the right load. So for us, when we have one of these high volume streams pumping in lots and lots of events, um, as the right load is spread across the whole cluster, as long as you've done your, your sharding and your indexing properly, you won't have one node running hot. Similarly, on the read side, um, you don't have to automatically read from the primary. You can read from the secondary if it's unlikely that you're going to get um, stale data or problems with sort of monotonic reads, non-monotonic reads. Uh, we also had sort of performance gains then by, by um, you know, sharding the data across multiple different sort of partitions. Um, it then meant that when we execute queries, as we'll look in a minute, we could then execute them concurrently across all nodes at the same time. Uh, a point to mention about multi-node um, redundancy as well, actually. Um, so within the cluster, that there's, there's additional nodes so that we have redundancy. And that was sort of useful um, from our perspective because we were very interested in obviously high availability and also availability across regions. So if a particular region of ours went down, we'll still have full availability, which is a, a, a great positive. And it's also worthy of a mention of, a, of the maintenance operations. By operating in a, in a shardy cluster rather than one very big database, it made the whole operation of backups and rehydrations and applying indexes and really the day-to-day -day maintenance much easier. And one other thing to mention was that, that Mongo provides um, quite a useful sort of declarative language called the Mongo aggregates. And we found that quite useful for doing queries and producing quite complex projections of our state. OK, so decoupling data um, um, from how it's written, from how it's read, is a very nice design principle. But now you have that, that harder task of getting to, to the state that you want. Um, on, on the read side. Now, obviously, the, the shopping cart was a, tri a, a, trivial, a trivial problem, but obviously a large log is going to be a lot more complicated. And this is where uh, techniques such as materialized views and lambda architectures that sort of offer approaches to, to a producing um, readily accessible views of a log um, that then align with the main query patterns of the application. Now, in our world, because we were dealing with um, multiple different flows, each with their own access needs and data structures, we didn't really have a sort of a concept of a common, a common read view, so we couldn't really use one of those techniques. So, so a materialized snapshot you know, certainly wasn't, wasn't viable. So instead, our technique was to create actually two logs. So we had one log, which is the, the, the top log, the, the, sort of the long bar across there, which, which had the business data in it. So this is obviously the reason the software has been written in the first place, to capture the definitions of those equities, those bonds, those, those derivatives and options. Um, now, in this law, because we had a lot of data, we wanted to keep the footprint as minimal as possible, so the indexes are, are very, very simple. Um, we'd expect generally the queries on that data, well, we'd like them to be simple, so we haven't got to put lots of you know, indexes and things, and, the, in and the, the queries will align with our indexes, but the data set's very, very large. But then we created another log, because we were embracing the IT, 
the uh, suggestions of, of the um, event sort of sourcing community. And so this, this, this second log is now modeling really only the, um, the semantics of the, of the metadata of those, of those batches. So this is now capturing a lot of very, very rich information about what's happening in our domain. You know, we know whether we've processed a full universe, whether it's a delta, whether it's a correction, what enterprise segment it is, what was the, the, what was the business time, what was the, um, the system time, um, you know, the, the, the times when the work started and when it, when it ended. So for this, we would expect our queries to be you know, quite, quite kind of rich so we could narrow down and find the, the data sets that we're interested in. Um, and then having, but, but then we've also got a very, a very, you know, a, a very, very small log there. It's not, it's not a big complex, complex log. So we can find things very, very quickly. We've got rich, rich indexes, and we're using this to capture all the context, context, and the semantics of that, of that information. Now, this, this approach, this, this approach we have here also kind of honours that, that functional model that we had of the, of the idea of data coming in being the, the, um, the, the superposition of all the data from a given point in time. So this functional schematic is, is providing an interpretation of how we applied that above that, that pattern we've just looked at in a, a data flow that then enabled us to drill into the log and pull out the data that we wanted to, to supply the queries and projections that were needed for our use cases. So the, the, the sharded Mongo cluster is actually our, our log we saw on the horizontally on the, on the previous slide, which has now been, has now been chunked up and is now um, sharded and, and partitioned across the cluster, of which we'd have many, many nodes in our, in our cluster. So that now means that we don't actually have one large log anymore. We have lots of relatively you know, small logs. So what this now means is that um, when a query comes in, we can access the first log to pull out the, the metadata that, that we wanted to, so we can narrow in and find the data sets they're interested in for the enterprise segment or the deltas or whatever it is that we wanted to process, then having found those, those pointers that we saw on the, on the previous page, actually, I think I skipped over that. So when we had found the data that we wanted, we have the, having found the data sets of interest, we can then use the pointers to, to locate the data in the actual log itself, illustrated by those arrows there. Yeah, so once we have found those, um, those, those pointers, we can then issue a concurrent you know, query across the whole Mongo you know, cluster to then access the, the records that, that we want that we're interested in processing on each individual node, which is a much smaller log. Um, now, because the data in those logs is, is, a, um, is, an, is an event log and it's, it's a, a time series, um, you might have multiple instances of the same identity. So if we had equity that has a unique key, you know, 100, that may appear multiple times in that, in that set of data. Um, so what we would need to do is we need to kind of group by and to do some deduplication so that we can then pick the latest record. Um, and but when we pick that latest record, we would pick it observing the, the 2D time that we looked at before. We consider both the, the, um, the business time and the system processing time. Now, when we inserted um, the uh, delete record in our shopping cart, you know, when the user didn't want to buy book three, um, what he actually inserted was a, was a tombstone. So for some of our projections, where we may want to find you know, record ID 100, or we only want the latest image of the records in the, in the current universe, or whatever projection that we're looking for, um, then we would need to drop the, uh, the we need to find the tombstones that have been recorded and eliminate them. Then when we bring all this data together, um, we can produce these sort of projections that um, enabled us to, to kind of solve these old, in, old and familiar problems that, that, we, that we had done in the past in less sustainable and scalable ways. So it might be, you know, what is the whole, universe's, the whole universe of equities for the Warsaw Stock Exchange at a particular point in time that we can do with this? We might want to know, well, what is the change of equities between this point in time and that point in time, or across 2D time, but we can do that as well. Then we can narrow it down across enterprise segments like Warsaw or London or US or a number of enterprise segments. Now, another useful uh, feature that, that, that we get with this is, is replay. You know, we might want to say, what are all the deltas that we've had in the last, in the last um, week? Um, I want to replay all the events from that, but I want to apply the deduplication because I don't want to pick up 
record ID 100 when 100 appeared on you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. I only want the latest image of that, which is going to be Fridays. So we get the, uh, the deduplication as well. We might want to look at a particular identity, like what did um, identity 300 look like at a particular point in time. We can do recon reconciliations and historic change analysis as well. Because we have the full information in the, in the log, rather than, and we're capturing the semantics, rather than using the, the traditional you know, CRUD approach. So let's just sort of reflect now on the, the final, final thoughts. Well, our motivations for, for rethinking was, was to get a more um, standardized and a more you know, scalable solution. And certainly, with that rich data set and the utility that it then offers, meant that we could you know, perform these, these um, computations that we had solved many times, like calculating the difference between you know, one universe and another to find the inserts, updates, and deletes on large data sets. But this offered a much more scalable way of doing it, rather than copying lots of data around. We get the full transparency event replay. Um, an interesting side effect of this is also retired records. So if we had run into our CRUD system, let's say all the equities for, um, for, for, for London, um, well, the equities for London would only include actually all those equities for London. So if we had, let's say, a million records, and in the database we had a, you know, a million 100,000, well, the 100,000 wouldn't be touched. We'd have to go through, find them, and delete them. Again, this is something which which was not necessarily implemented in a standardized fashion. With this new system, because we understand the semantics of, of full universe processing, when we've captured that full universe for, for London, let's say, we don't have to go and retire any records. We just have another um, a point in the log for where we can read on from that point onwards. That then gives us a new universe. Resilience and recovery. So this was a, a strong motivation for, um, for using this, this approach of not, of not changing, changing data. Now, if we were to apply stale data, so let's say it's Friday, and for some reason someone did something, did something wrong, perhaps a job was left running over the weekend and some testing had been going on. So let's say on Friday that Monday's data was then replayed. Well, that in our old system would have caused a lot of problem. In this system, all that would do is um, redefine the data on, on Sunday, but at a later point in time, on Friday. But it wouldn't actually change anything as long as Sunday's data was actually correct. So in our old system, we would have to then recover the, the full state by making sure we ran Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and someone would have to handhold that, and there would be a certain period of outage. Um, rogue data. Now, if we had our, um, our problem with our equity file, where we you know, replayed you know, last year's data, um, yes, there would be some manual intervention now required, because what we'd have to do is we'd have to go in and find, we'd have to go in and find our, our um, our rogue data, which is going to be D0 here, and we just make sure we didn't then include that in our projection. Similarly, parallel recovery. Well, you know, I wanted to be able to recover much quicker than we had in the past. So another example is actually on a, a very, very complex flow where there was just dozens and dozens and dozens of records, all very, very large, lots of fragmented data. Now, it would take about 30 hours to feed all of this data through. Um, because it had to be flowed through um, file by file in very, very strict sequential order. With this, um, with this approach here, with, we, could, we could apply all of the data in parallel into the log that rather than taking 30 hours would take about sort of four hours. Um, and then, of course, then the reader can then just pick and choose what they want by picking the right data sets and pull the data out. So that's really sort of a variation of out-of-order processing. It doesn't mean that on on Friday, you have to process Friday's data. On Friday, you can process Thursday's data or Wednesday's data, again, if you have to. Uh, low friction persistence, yeah, I mentioned that. I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was notable how easy it was to create a document of an aggregate and to store them. Low friction concurrency, I mean, that's a really interesting one because we didn't really jump through any hoops to provide decent throughput. Um, I think we should sort of try to do sensible things at the right time. Um, but, but we certainly didn't have to kind of break an awful lot of sweat on that, and, it, and, it, and we had the, um, the sort of throughput that we then, we then required. Um, with the rich metadata that we had captured to do with you know, our fulls, or whether it's delta, or whether it's um, what enterprise segment it is, um, it, it, it then made it easier to implement more hygiene controls. So if it was you know, Friday, then the system would understand you know, the concepts of, of the, the date and time of the data that was in process, and it would be quite easy to, it's easy to implement hygiene controls to make sure, are you really sure you want to run Sunday's data on Friday when you've already run it? 
And from a database perspective, there's a lot less friction to do with backups, index builds, node recovery, general maintenance. Um, we found much, much sort of simpler with this, with this arrangement. OK. Thank you very much for, for listen, listening to me at this, this late point in the, in the afternoon. Really appreciate it. Do you have any questions in the last few minutes? <laughs>